we're first going to have thanks. We're first going to have a, an introduction that really goes into detail on why genetic diversity is important in the context of biodiversity and particularly the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And then we'll have a, a more detailed second session on uh, how genetic diversity is measured in the biodiversity context and some specific examples there. Mm -hmm. So as we go through, I'll, uh, I'll introduce the panelists separately and we'll have a, a bit of a break for Q&A in between these two sort of mini sessions within, within today's session. Um, I also wanna start off by just letting everyone know, for those of you who are maybe a little less familiar with the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, um, the framework is, of course, being developed as the guiding path for the next decade in terms of biodiversity planning at the global level um, and to, to try to garner action towards biodiversity goals and targets. The Global Biodiversity Framework also includes a vision to 2050 of, of where we want the world to, to be in the next 30 years. Um, and Genetic biodiversity, or genetic diversity, sorry. Um, genetic diversity is, is really central to the entire global biodiversity framework. It is recognized in the very first goal, which is, as I said, sort of 2050 vision. And it comes in different targets throughout the framework, which are action oriented. Um, and in the case of today's session, there are specific indicators also in goal A related to genetic di diversity, which will, I think Sean and um, others will go into as we, as we go through the session to provide an example of not just why genetic diversity is important for biodiversity, but how do we measure it? How do we track it? How do we use that information in order to guide national policy and to assess progress at the global level? Um, and, and so this is really what this session is about, is trying to describe where this fits in and, and how do we move forward um, in, the, in the next year up until when this framework is adopted and then how do we use this information going forward. So with that, I would like to introduce the first two panelists. As I said, we'll have sort of a, a mini session and then another mini session. Our first two panelists are Linda, Linda Lake here, who is a professor of population and conservation genetics at Stockholm University. She is specialized in different aspects of monitoring of gen genetic diversity and is a member of Sweden's scientific expert group that provides advice to the CBD delegation. We also have Sean Hoban, who's a conservation biologist at the Morton Arbitorium, uh, which is near Chicago. He focuses on monitoring genetic diversity, improving the conservation of biodiversity in botanical gardens and seed banks, and he interfaces with science and policy. He also leads the GeoBond Genetic Composition Working Group and is a co-founder of the Coalition for Conservation Genetics. So with that, I will hand over to Linda and Sean. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, Julian. So I will share my screen and why is genetic important and what is effective population size or NE, a key parameter for conserving genetic diversity? Those are the topics that I will talk about. And most people think about biodiversity mostly as species and ecosystems and often recognizing that when a species becomes extinct, that can affect the whole ecosystem, it can actually collapse. But in addition to these levels, we also have a basic level of biodiversity, genetic diversity, which is actually the basis for everything. And genetic diversity originates in differences at the DNA level. A specific gene can occur in different variants, and those are called alleles. And I typically use colors to illustrate this variation. So different variants of the same gene alleles results in that we have genetic differences, genetic variation within populations, as well as between populations. And these differences can reflect adaptation to specific local environmental conditions. And this is really the toolbox for continued evolution, for allowing adaptations of populations and for long-term survival of species and populations. And 
if we lose genetically distinct populations, that can have equal negative effects on ecosystems as species diversity loss has. So we know from extensive genetic research over the past few decades or 50, 60 decades or so that high genetic diversity within a species, lots of allele variants is often associated with high adaptive capacity, a good potential for long-term survival and a high resilience. While the opposite is true for populations with low genetic diversity, they have lower adaptive capacity, weaker potential for surviving on a long-term basis and low resilience. And this low genetic diversity is often associated with small population size. We rapidly lose genetic diversity when a population becomes small. And we have many examples from empirical studies on this, but just to mention a couple. Corals were able to adapt to warmer ocean clients based on high levels of genetic diversity, while a population of wolves on the Isle Royale became small, highly inbred, lost a lot of genetic variation and became functionally extinct. So a key question in biodiversity conservation is, how fast does my particular population lose genetic variation? Is a particular population large enough to maintain sufficient levels to allow adaptations into the future? And that's when effective population size or NE comes into the picture because NE will provide the answer to those important questions. And we can think of NE by using an olive, the shape of an olive and then thinking that the green area of the olive represents the census size, the number of individuals of a population, often abbreviated as NC, while the red area of the olive is the effective population size, NE, that reflects how the population acts genetically. So it's NE that determines the rate at which this population retains or lose genetic diversity. And typically NE is a lot smaller than NC. And that's why the olive shape is helpful in thinking about this concept. And why is NE often much smaller than sensor size? Well, there are several demographic parameters that affects NE. And we can have a simple example of this, just looking at one of the parameters that affects NE, namely the sex ratio. So let's assume we have one population here with census size 100, but it has a highly skewed sex ratio, only one male and 99 females. While this example here has completely equal sex ratio, but it's small, NC is four, two males and two females. And the equation for, for calculating effective size using only this specific demographic parameter looks like this with NM the number of males and NF the number of females. So if we put our values for the first case into this equation, we have four multiplied by one, multiplied by 99, et cetera, and we end up with an effective size of four. And if we use the values of the small population, we end up with the same effective population size four. So in, in both these cases, the, they lose genetic diversity at the same rate, even though NC is much larger here due to the skewed sex ratio. Another important factor that affects NE is variation in offspring number. So let's assume that we have these individuals that are sexually mature, they can breed, but only two of them actually contribute offspring to the next generation. And we see immediately that that results in allele variants that are carried by non-reproducing individuals gets lost from the population. So if we have few adult individuals that reproduce and contribute offspring, that can lead to rapid loss of genetic diversity. There are several other demographic factors as well. So there are many equations that are needed to calculate effective population size, but it can be done. And then what then the key question is how large does the genetic effective population size needs to be to retain enough variation and there is a well established scientifically based rule of thumb that stipulates that effective size ne should be 500 or larger in order for a particular population to retain sufficient levels of genetic diversity over time so that's why we have suggested that we use this rule of thumb as in an indicator in the post 2020 framework. 
our proposed indicator one is the number of populations within a species with an effective size above 500 compared to the number of population that has an E below 500. And we see now that in the present suggestion for headline indicator in the first draft of the post 2020 framework, this indicator is included. So that's extremely encouraging. And we need to know, of course, how we can assess NE. And we can do that in several ways. We can have do it from detailed demographic data, similarly to the sex ratio example here. And if we have less uh, detailed demographic data, we can use computer simulations using modeling various demographic information, or we can assess NE from molecular genetic or genotypic data or genomic data. So there are several ways to, to use and many estimates are available based on several or one of these types of, of uh, me methods. And of course, we will have many cases where we do not have assessments of any use in, in from, from any data. We don't have any data at all. And in those cases, we should suggest that we can use census size as a proxy because review work of the typical ratio between the relationship between effective size and census size shows that 0.1 is a good general proxy. That's a typical mean or median value. So that results in NE, the red area of the olive, typically around 10%, while NC is around 90%. So we suggest that we can use this uh, relationship, which then results in a census size of 5,000 needed in order to reach the target value NE 500. Of course, there is variation around this estimate. This is mean and typical mean or median va values from review work, but there is variation. And we can look at some of that variation here from one of our recent publications. So here are different taxonomic groups and different sample sizes. And the, the thick black line here is the median value for different taxonomic groups. And the, the dashed line here is the 0.1 NE to NC.1. So we can see that some groups are above this value and others are very close to it or another, while others are below this threshold value. And if we look at the same data, but in a different graph, we can see that plants in green here show the same pattern, the same type of pattern NE NC ratio as all other texts at the gray bars here. So we suggest for applying the ND indicator, basing in it on available information on NE, that in case it with no information, we assume NE to NC of 0.1 and then use the NC above 5,000 as the target. In cases where we do have genetic or demographic estimates of NE, we use those estimates to find out if NE is above 500 or not. And in cases where we have general information on the NC-NC ratio from a similar taxonomic group as the population of interest, we apply this ratio and then find out if the NC that we have is enough to support an NE of 500. And by that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Um, I will now take over for the rest of the, the first part of the session. Okay, the screen is okay. Let me know if there's any problems, please. Thank you all for coming. I, uh, after that nice introduction from Dr. Leiker of the importance of genetic diversity and why effective size is different from census size, I will now explain the three indicators for genetic diversity, which have been developed over the past two years by a large coalition of scientists from various global nature conservation organizations listed here. As you know, genetic diversity has been a part of the CBD framework since the beginning, and there were previously targets for genetic diversity shown here. Genetic diversity is also included, as Jillian and Dr. Leiker mentioned, in goal A and target four of the framework draft one, which was released a few weeks ago. 
The reason for including genetic diversity, as Dr. Leikra explained, is that genetic diversity is vital for species to adapt and persist, especially during climate change and new diseases and other environmental change. Without genetic diversity, species will not survive change. Genetic diversity also helps ecosystems persist and recover from extreme events like heat waves. And genetic diversity supports other elements of biodiversity and nature's contributions to people. There were several indicators used in CBD reports in the past, but it has been pointed out that each of these uh, has some issues. They either do not track genetic diversity very well, or they focus on domesticated species, neglecting 99% of all other species. To derive reliable indicators for genetic diversity, we should ask, how do we maintain genetic diversity and the ability for species to adapt? There are at least three things to ensure. Maintain sufficiently large populations to prevent loss of genetic diversity. Prevent loss of populations and their local genetic adaptations. And monitor genetic diversity directly to inform management actions. These three important elements of conserving genetic diversity are reflected in the three indicators proposed, which I will now explain in detail. First, I note that in recent comments from parties on the indicators uh, on this document shown here, there were 21 positive comments supporting one or more of these indicators and no negative comments, though several comments requested more guidance. Development of these indicators has been and is a collaboration between the four largest genetic diversity conservation groups globally, led by Geobon, a global community of practice and a longtime partner of the CBD. This work is consistent with Geobon's mission to enable the use of biodiversity observations to support policy, monitoring, reporting, and intervention. Okay, indicator one focuses on as Dr. Leiker explained, the well-established threshold to prevent genetic erosion. Much below an effective size of 500, genetic erosion is rapid. And much above this size, genetic erosion is slow or minimal. Now, CBD has used the concept of effective size for several decades. A threshold in the effective size is how a domestic breed is declared threatened. Distinct populations are the wild equivalent of breeds so we are just adapting the use of this very well accepted concept from threatened breeds to populations. Effective size is also a geobon essential biodiversity variable. We are working to create workflows and guidance for parties to find and use the necessary data. But briefly, I will note that there are abundant data to support this indicator at global and national levels. As Dr. Leiker explained, Effective size can be measured with genetic or demographic data, and in the absence of such data, a transformation of the census size can be used. There are numerous sources of census data, including national wildlife agencies, organized citizen counts, data within the IUCN Red List, and more. I will show just a few. This is an excerpt from a report from a national wildlife agency in the USA, showing existing populations of this rare plant and each of their census size. There are hundreds of similar reports for endangered species in the USA, and I suspect in many countries there are similar reports on endangered species. These are quotes from a IUCN Red List assessment. If you go to the population tab uh, for many species, you will find actual counts per population. And here are some of many examples in the scientific literature of effective size and uh, effective and census size um, over time and across space for two organisms. These were just a few of uh, the many easy to find examples. Indicator two focuses on maintaining populations and their adaptations to the local environment. Other CBD indicators focus on species range changes like the species habitat index, but none focus on loss of distinct populations, which is a major basis of genetic change. This indicator builds on another geobond EBV, genetic differentiation. 
Some of the data sources for this indicator are listed here, including global and national sources, essentially data sources with maps or records of past and present populations. These are maps from the Map of Life, which was explained more in the previous GeoBond CBD webinar, which you can find online. These are maps from the IUCN Red List, which sometimes show the uh, extinct or former extent of a species range. And here's a regional flora of Western North America with dated observations. The third indicator for genetic diversity tracks the use of of genetic studies. Analysis of genetic data has been used for more than 30 years to support direct actions for managing wild plant and animal populations. There are many thousands of such applied studies. Searching for such studies could include looking in scientific publications, government documents, or open access databases. In fact, several surveys of the number of genetic uh, publications per country have already been performed. For example, as of 2013, eight years ago, some Central and South American countries already had dozens or hundreds of such studies. Many more studies have happened as genetic technology has become cheaper and more available in the past eight years. This was a similar survey done in Europe showing the temporal accumulation of such genetic studies uh, unfortunately showing a bias towards IUCN least concerned species. And the IUCN Conservation Genetic Specialist Group is actually developing a pipeline to make basic calculations of, uh, to find such studies and make basic calculations on them and develop a simple standard report that any country can use. So those are the indicators. The case studies in the second part of the webinar will show that parties can leverage their national databases for reporting on at least tens of carefully chosen representative species per country. This gives national parties both agency and flexibility to use their data available. In addition, we are working to develop global and scalable decision support tools, including databases and workflows for each of the indicators. I would briefly mention that the goal and milestone are improving, but they're not quite clearly enough connected to the indicators. It may be advisable to highlight both the loss of populations and the maintenance of genetic diversity, the two components of genetic change, and managing and monitoring genetic diversity in the goal and in the milestone. It may also be advisable for the target to point to these distinct pieces of genetic change and to connect to the indicators. The indicators and how they connect to potential goal and target wording are, were presented in a policy brief uh, in 2020, which is available for free. The indicators are SMART as explained in a recent open access publication. So SMART specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. There are uh, several other supporting documents on the CBD website explaining the indicators in more detail, including an information document from SUBSTA24 presented by GeoVon. And the need for these indicators is emphasized by a very recent analysis of genetic diversity in CBD national reports, summarized in a policy brief and a paper released just a few weeks ago. A list of these and other important references will be available at the end of the talk for you to look up uh, at your convenience. We have held multiple webinars to introduce the indicators of the past year and received feedback, including positive comments, but also several questions such as those shown here. And I look forward to answering your questions in a moment. Going forward, we will do further webinars and develop direct connections with parties to work on data sources and a guidance manual. Please contact myself or Dr. Leiker if you would like to test data sources for your country or participate in the development of guidance documents. We would like this to be a collaborative, party-driven process. Here are some of those references that you can explore on your own. Note the policy briefs, high level and, numer and in numerous languages you can find here. And here are some more references. 
To conclude, the indicators are sensitive to change, scalable, have data available, and are supported by numerous parties. They support the current goal and target, though the wording of those could be improved some, and we have a plan to trial indicators and make them operational by working with national parties. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda and Sean. Um, I think I'm gonna start, there's a question in the chat and I'm, I'm gonna sort of rephrase the question because I have a similar question myself. Um, and I, I, I know that um, the, the question is really on, are these indicators ready to go? And as you mentioned, I mean, there is certainly data in a lot of places on different species that is ready to go. There is a solid methodology for rolling these out. However, I would say that, um, I mean, a few things. One, a lot of the examples that you show are based in North America, where we do, where the there is a strong monitoring system in place compared to some other parts of the world. Uh, additionally, there will be a, a investment that's required in many places in order to better capture genetic diversity. And this includes even trying to determine really which populations and species are key for starting monitoring programs. And so I'm wondering, you know, you were talking about really working with parties to roll this out, how do you see this progressing um, when you have a, a country that doesn't have a lot of experience in measuring genetic diversity? How do they get started? How do they figure out what the priorities are um, and take the operationalization of this indicator forward? So uh, I can, Sean and Linda, I think if you want, but maybe we'll start with Sean. Okay. Um... So after this first break, this first Q&A, we will have four parties present their uh, current um, process and their current perspective. So those parties will present the data that they have available, how they are choosing species to monitor, um, and things like that. So um, the first thing uh, to think about is the data available. So I pointed out that data can be accessed from for example, wildlife management plans. Many countries have wildlife management plans for their endangered species. Um, as Linda pointed out, um, the actual use of genetic data is not necessary. So um, in many cases, we can use a, a transformation of the census size. So that's, that's the important thing, is, is really the demographic and the occurrence data that's being leveraged. Um, the second part is maybe choosing which and how many species um, we envision that countries would report on a, a, a relatively small subset of the species at the national level. So it might be tens or uh, in, in more biodiverse regions, uh, maybe hundreds of species, but certainly not all of the species in, in the country. Um, though some countries may have that um, ability. Um, I think that's all I'll say at the moment, and, and maybe this country, this, this question might be better after each of the, the countries have, have had a chance to, to report on, um, give their presentations on, on their perspective and, and how they're answering those exact questions. But Linda, do you have anything else to add? Not at this point. I think that was a very good summary. Thanks. Okay, so I, I think we'll move on to the next set of questions then. Maybe. Um, I, I do think that it's not near as straightforward as you just made it sound. Um, I think that it is a, it's a, it's a complex issue to, to figure out which species are going to be monitored and how many species. And many species won't have that census size. So even if you're not doing a, a complete um, measurement of genetic diversity, and, and you're using a transformation of the census size, I think that that won't exist in many cases. And so there will be a need to invest in, in really building out these monitoring systems, the same for many of the indicators. Uh, and, and I know the countries that we're going to hear from next have already started to go through this, through this process. And so it will be really great to hear from them on sort of how they, how they got this going and, and how they identified the priorities, because I think it's going to be very useful for parties that haven't, haven't started on this process yet. So with that, maybe we'll go to the next set of speakers. Um, we have four 
presenters, panelists from different places who are going to, to walk us through what they've done um, in their context. So I'll introduce them all and then we can go through. So the first is Jessica De Silvia. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the South African National Biodiversity Institute. Her main field of research includes population and conservation genetics and applying molecular techniques to address conservation issues in South Africa. For the past five years, that included genetic monitoring of threatened species. Um, and she's also involved in the national biodiversity reporting that pertains to genetic diversity. Then we have Alicia Mastrada Yanis, who's a evolutionary biologist and population geneticist. She's currently a CONACYT research fellow at ConBio, where she aims to incorporate evolutionary process into the conservation and management of Mexican biodiversity. Then we have David O'Brien, who manages the evidence and reporting and terrestrial vascular plant teams for Nature Scott, which is the government agency responsible for nature conservation in Scotland. Uh, his work includes conservation of wild plants and development and production of indicators such as ecosystem health indicators and con convention on biological diversity reports as we were talking about earlier. Um, and then finally, the last speaker, speaker is Per Jordan Gulf, sorry if I've massacred everyone's names, and he did his PhD in animal ecology and became an associate professor in conservation biology later on. And he has a wealth of experience across 25 years um, working in, in different fields related to biodiversity and is currently the principal research officer at the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. He specializes in population modeling um, and population viability analysis and science society interfacing. I also realized I forgot to introduce myself, which I almost always do. Uh, my name is Jillian Campbell and I lead the work on monitoring, review and reporting at the Convention on Biological Diversity Secretariat. So with that, I'll hand over to the four panelists. Um, so Jessica, over to you. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to share a South African perspective on the genetic diversity indicators that are being proposed for the global biodiversity framework. And as many of you are aware, South Africa is exceptionally rich in biological diversity with about 67,000 species of animals and over 20,000 species of plants. And through the years, major efforts and achievements have been made in quantifying, assessing and monitoring this diversity as well as their ecosystems. So as a result, there is a large body of data and tools that we use in national reporting and that can be incorporated into um, genetic diversity assessments. As of 2018, South Africa has a seamless map of ecosystem types across the terrestrial marine, freshwater and estuarine realms. In addition, uh, each ecosystem type has a threat status and protection level. With respect to species, detailed data exists for several taxonomic groups, and this includes species occurrence records, which are essentially verified point occurrence records that are then used to create interpreted distribution maps. And so we have two examples here with the Western leopard toad on the top and the Cape parrot at the bottom. And these maps are what can be seen on the IUCN Red List as well as our national databases. We also have data on IUCN Red List status for all of the taxonomic groups listed here. And for some of these, we also have species trend data. Most recently, we also have species protection level data. And all of these three levels of data are currently available for all birds, mammals, reptiles, fish, um, plants, butterflies, and a few other invertebrate groups. And in addition to um, these data, we also have some long-term environmental data sets, um, as well as land cover and land use data. So in addition to species and ecosystem reporting, South Africa has shown strong support for better incorporating genetic diversity in national reporting. In 2018, genetic diversity was given a true platform in the National Biodiversity Assessment with some landscape level genetic diversity indicators trialed to identify areas essential for the maintenance of genetic diversity. And there was also a chapter on genetic monitoring, which was more of an overview of why genetic monitoring is important and how South Africa can take part. It also showcased some case studies that built on the earlier work of Sean and colleagues on genetic diversity indicators. 
And I hope that in the next phase of our national reporting, genetic diversity will occupy an even larger space. Um, as the benefit of genetic diversity in biological conservation and management is well appreciated by various stakeholders within local and national governments, NGOs, academia, and other research institutions. To date, the vast majority of population genetic studies and genetic monitoring research has been conducted in an ad hoc manner, where the interest and or need has been identified. The majority of these studies have largely been on threatened species across a range of taxonomic groups. The images here illustrate some of the key examples. And these studies either report on all three or at least one of the genetic diversity indicators being proposed for the inclusion in the global biodiversity framework. In addition to threatened species, similar studies have also been conducted on species of commercial interest, such as king clip and abalone, as well as a species of cultural and social importance, such as the cheetah and Cape buffalo and some agricultural breeds and crops. Not much focused work has been done thus far on prioritizing species to include in genetic monitoring. However, South Africa is developing a uh, biodiversity monitoring framework, which will incorporate genetic diversity and discussions may include um, species prioritization. Um, it is definitely recognized that species within any of the listed categories here and likely more would benefit greatly from genetic monitoring. However, given the amount of diversity we have, even prioritizing within and among these groups um, is daunting, but it's not impossible. So let's take, for example, threatened species, which I'm more familiar with. Of the 12 taxonomic groups containing the most complete species data, there is 3,157 threatened species. If we narrow this down to species that are also endemic, the number goes down significantly to 315. I do realize, however, that many non-threatened, non-endemic species would be of interest to report on monitors. So this is just an example. If we proceed with other criteria, we might look to see which of the 315 uh, threatened endemics are not well protected, which cuts the number down to 255. And just looking at the groups I am much more familiar with, amphibians and reptiles, there are 21 species that fall within that threatened endemic and not well protected category. And I'll be going into those two groups uh, in a little more detail. For amphibians, there are 16 species of threatened endemics that are not well protected. Two of these have the full suite of indicators for at least one population. There is a measure of effective population size, an indication of the proportion of species that remains, and whether a genetic method has been used to monitor the diversity within the species. The remaining 14 species do not have uh, population genetic information on them that can feed specifically into any of the indicators. Um, and although indicator two here suggests that the Western leopard toes, Sclarphos pantherina, may be faring slightly better than Capenzi bufferosii, Rose's mountain toadlet, the species has experienced over 90% loss in its habitat and is showing signs of continuing decline with increased levels of inbreeding being detected in just 10 years. Now, moving on to reptiles, of the 15 reptile species that are, are threatened endemics and not well protected, three species have data on indicator two, the proportion of populations remaining. However, by reanalyzing the microsatellite data sets for each species, information on indicator one can be acquired, and for Bradypodium thamnobates, a temporal assessment can also be gained. And for all of these species, all populations are believed to exist, so there's 100% in each. However, each is experiencing declines in either numbers or habitat. So when we look at opportunities, uh, South Africa, I feel, is in a great position to provide a developing countries and especially African perspective on the feasibility of compiling and reporting on these indicators and trialing prioritization techniques. Within South Africa, so much data currently exists. We just need to be aware of what's available and what more can be done with it whether it be reanalyzing data sets, including additional sampling to add a temporal component or accessing his historical material. By far the greatest challenges we see facing the inclusion of genetic diversity in national reporting is finding the resources and capacity to implement what is required. By resources, I mainly mean financial. This work is not cheap, especially in developing countries, even with ever decreasing costs. And if more such studies would be needed, um, a lot more money would need to be committed. And currently no money is committed for um, this work in national reporting. It would also take a time to compile and generate the information for reporting, which leads into the challenges we have with respect to capacity. South Africa has the means in terms of infrastructure um, and the knowledge and experience in conducting this research. 
um, but we would need more people carrying out more research to meet the targets. We would also need people and or some mechanism of compiling this information onto a centralized database. This would involve training more people and possibly initiating more collaborations or maybe even putting bilateral agreements in place, which when saying it is actually seems to be like really good opportunities. So with all this said, South Africa um, values its commitment to the CBD and if genetic diversity is given a greater platform in the post 2020 global biodiversity framework, we will do everything in our means to support the indicators, to report on the indicators and in doing so contribute to a more well-rounded CBD vision. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. So now we will hand over to Alicia. Thank you very much. Um, can you please confirm if you are seeing my presentation? Yep, I can see it. It's, yeah, um, yeah there you go, now it's full screen. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna provide you an example of what we propose from Conavia, which is a national commission. Oh, this is keeping, sorry. From the understanding that you have biodiversity. Um, we think that a key aspect is first selecting the species uh, and then gathering the data needs that each indicator has. So for choosing the species, we propose to first focus on crop wild relatives because this is something of interest for the country that we already have, uh, but also additionally to focus on a subset of species that are first of all representative of each of Mexico's major ecosystems. And these species, we think they could be some sort of umbrella species, including some species at risk, but also other species that are just well studied and could be representative of these ecosystems. We think that we should include, of course, all major taxonomic groups, but also species with contrasting dispersal abilities and different forms of rarity. To choose a species, we propose to have a workshop with experts that includes experts in population genetics and phylogeography, but also experts in the different taxonomic groups. With this workshop, we could have a preliminary list of potential species of which we then can confirm data availability for each of the indicators and finally decide a final species list in a workshop with the same experts that I mentioned before. Now let's imagine that we already have this species list. Then the first challenge for all three indicators is defining populations within a species. This is easy for, easy for isolated populations like uh, sky islands, but not so easy for widespread ecosystems. So for this, we propose to use proxies of genetic diversity, which is an approach that we already used in a systematic conservation planning approach from crop wild relatives, which is under, currently under review, and you can see the preprint in the link below. Here we propose to define areas holding potentially genetically differentiated populations based in the following proxies. First, environmental drivers and also historical drivers of population differentiation. We propose to first define Holdridge life zones, which can be done with environmental data, and then to subdivide it, each of these life zones, for instance, and as an example, the life zones 20 in the right, to subdivide it in areas potentially having historically isolation processes based on a literature review on other phylogeographic studies. With this, we estimated around 100 areas proxies of genetic diversity for the country, which can be used to crop species distribution models or just occurrence data of any species to define areas, again, potentially holding genetically differentiated populations. As for the indicators, for the first indicator, um, we think that data can be obtained from abundance data that can be estimated from citizen science observation, and I will mention this later. But also, as other authors have mentioned before, many species have published genetic studies already, and this is where talking with the experts becomes a key step. Um, and also in Conavio, we have been uh, funding and pushing for crop wild relatives monitoring programs to occur, including genetic samples. And I'm gonna show you an example of this. We have a monitoring program in Teosintle, which are the crop wild relatives of maize, where all taxa had been 
extensively sampled and genetic data has been generated for several samples across all or most populations of the species. So uh, this is an example of a well, very well studied uh, species as for the crop wide relatives. For the indicator two, uh, we can basically summarize it as determining if populations still exist. Here we think that the areas proxy of genetic diversity that I mentioned before, or if populations are easier to define can be used. Um, then we can use occurrence data, both from historical connections and also from citizen science to estimate if populations are still out there. Conavio has gathered data of these different sources in a single platform from called Encyclovida, and I will show you a brief example. This is Coniferus monticola, which we think could be a good representative of alpine grasslands uh, at mountain tops. It has a large range with very narrow habitat. You can see in purple the historical records and in orange the data from citizen science platforms. Uh, this is another example with an entirely different species, a uh, hummingbird, which, could, with, which we think could be a representative of pine oak forest and has a much broad habitat. And here I am highlighted in yellow the data coming from eBird or Averaves, which is a Mexican version of eBird. And this data could potentially be translated into abundance data. Also, this is an example of a species that has been very well studied uh, from the research community from a genetical perspective. We also think that we could incorporate ecosystem integrity, which tell us not only um, where are the different ecosystems distributed, but how well they are preserved. And this data, along with expert knowledge, um, the taxon could be used to determine if a population is still likely to occur in a given area. As for the last indicator, obviously, it needs genetic data, but we think that before going out and performing new studies, we could systematize what is already out there. As an example, in Mexico at Conavio, we have been identifying genetic studies of uh, species at risk. We have already identified studies for more than 20% of these species, but of course, much more data is available as shown in the bar plot below, which uh, says, which species of different taxonomic groups have data with coordinates for a species sample at Mexico. And this is data from GenePank. Uh, as I mentioned, the fact that there's already a lot of data out there could mean that we can choose the species to be more informative to tell us uh, not only how the species is, but how the species of that ecosystem are doing in terms of conservation of their populations and genetic diversity. In summary, this is the workflow that we will propose in Conavio to assess these indicators for the case of Mexico. Again, focusing on crop wild relatives on one hand, but also in other species entirely wild, not related to agriculture on the other but that could help uh, to be as indicators or umbrella species for each ecosystem and have already well studied data. I also highlight the need to interact with OCK experts in both population genetics and phylogeography, but also in all of the taxon groups. And I also would like to highlight the need to systematize the data that is already out there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia, for the presentation. Oh, and um, I became a forest somehow. You did. <laughs> it's it's the it's the reverse of how those things are supposed to work, where it has decided your face is not the face and the forest. There you go. Um, yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. And the, I, I think the workflow at the very end was very useful also for answering the, some of the previous questions that I had and others had on, on sort of the process. Um, with that, I will hand over to David um, for his press for the next present. All right. Is this sharing okay? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. My name is David O'Brien, and I work for Nature Scott, which is the government agency charged with biodiversity in Scotland, biodiversity conservation in Scotland. 
and I'd like to tell you about the scorecard that we have developed and published here in Scotland. Okay. And I'd also like to change the page, which is not going to let me do. Ah, thank you. Right, thank you. Okay, so the scorecard approach that we have here was designed to be applicable in any country, in any region, regardless of financial resources. Um, the project founders with, were concerned with reporting against the CBD target 13, which you may recall, um, which had been agreed at the 2010 HD conference, but it didn't adequately reflect the importance of wild species, as I think some of the speakers have already mentioned. And subsequent research by uh, Sean Hoban and many of us on this call has confirmed that this is an issue internationally. Um, and the focus tends to be on cultivating the domestic species, very little for wild species at all. Um, post 2020, we've, we've now seen the first draft of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework, and that seems to offer far more opportunity. But um, we, we're keen to provide a tool that can be applied to the task and one that would work anywhere. So what were we reporting in Scotland and the rest of the UK? Quite similar to, to many of our international partners, a number of flowering plant accessions in holding uh, zones. Um, so a little bit, very little on wild species in ex situ. The main focus was on domesticated plants, and there was no real role, no recognition, sorry, of the role of genetic diversity and biodiversity conservation. So back in 2017, uh, the project started, and we wanted to devise an easy to use method to assess the genetic diversity of wild species. And in order to build commitment to the project, uh, rather like uh, the approach that Alicia uh, outlined, we brought together a wide range of stakeholders that include, in our case, botanic gardens, universities, research institutes, agricultural researchers, uh, non-governmental organizations, and government agencies. And we also brought together a broad range of expertise in plants, animals, and fungi. Uh, and in order to spearhead the team, we brought in government representatives as well to the management team to make sure that whatever we did was going to be useful. So back in the, uh, in the previous version, it talked about other socioeconomically valuable species, as well as selected wild species of plants and animals. And this posed a big question of what that would mean. Um, it says plants and animals. The new uh, draft talks about all species. We were very conscious that we wanted to include fungi as well. Uh, and we wanted an approach that would work anywhere not just an economically rich, but species poor nation like the United Kingdom. We wanted an approach that could use the existing very heterogeneous data that's out there, rather than relying on freshly collected standardized genetic data. And that mean, meant that we needed an understanding of species ecology to allow us to assess what the pre-existing genetic data meant for biodiversity as a whole. And we also wanted the reporting to fit in with the context of evolution. Genetic diversity is not static. It's subject to pressures, natural, anthropogenic, and a combination of the two. So the method we devised used a set of five criteria for defining terrestrial and freshwater species of socioeconomic importance in Scotland. Uh, and we selected five for each of these, five species for each of these categories, making a total of 26. There's a reason for that. It's not just we don't do maths particularly well, um, but it comes back to the flexibility kind of thing, I guess. Um, we published this. Uh, for each selection criterion, we went for a broad taxonomic diversity. So first of all, National Conservation Priority Wild Species. This was taken from a government endorsed program, the Species Action Framework, um, and the steering groups selected a subspecies, a subset with broad taxonomic coverage to invertebrates, one vertebrate, fungus, uh, and a vascular plant. 
Next, species of natural cultural importance. These species were taken from a national survey of culturally important species and included both animals and plants. Uh, due to high levels of public concern at this point over the decline of the European ash, uh, Fraxinus excelsior, we added that species. Uh, species providing key economics, ecological ecosystem, oh, pardon me, so you wouldn't think English was my first language, would you? Species providing key ecosystem services, that's quite difficult to assess. Uh, so what we chose to do was to pick the three non-planted vascular plant species in terms of land cover, um, and also add um, sphagnum papillosum, which is a, a, a bog moss, as a key species in carbon capture and in uh, water quality amelioration, and also the common frog rana temporaria as the most widely distributed vertebrate in mainland Scotland and an important regulator of vertebrate populations. Species of importance for wild harvesting, food and medicine. Uh, forage food is not an important dietary element in Scotland, but it is culturally important. And the steering group wanted the scorecard to be relevant to the needs of people in less disturbed ecosystems. And finally on here, economically important game species. Hunting and fishing are economically important activities across much of Scotland. The species selected were two fish, uh, two mammals and a bird. We selected based on economic grounds, but we could e easily have um, selected based on dietary importance. And this could be important, for example, in countries where sustainable management of bushmeat uh, is important because that must include genetic diversity. For each of the selected species, we, uh, uh, they, were, they were assessed by an authority on that species using a standardized scorecard approach, which I'll outline in a minute. And that was independently quality assured by a further specialist and finally by uh, an editorial team to ensure consistency. So what's in each of them? Well, it's not dependent on prior genetic knowledge. Instead, it uses structured expert opinion on assessments of one, uh, are demograph demographic declines likely to lead to loss of diversity, genetic erosion? Uh, and this ties in nicely with uh, what Sean was saying about indicator one related to NE. Uh, loss of divergent lineages corresponding with Sean's indicator two, loss of genetic differentiation. Uh, we looked at hybridization, likely to lead to undesirable replacement of genetic diversity. We looked at restrictions in regeneration turnover. Um, and for plant species in particular, where seed banking is a viable mechanism for holding genetic resources ex situ, uh, the reviewers also report on the representativeness of those ex situ collections against an overall, overall picture of the country. We also looked at uh, the overall level of threat and stated how confident we were in that because with some species they're very well studied and we're quite confident, others much harder to do. Um, so that was another important area because we didn't want to give a false area of confidence where we weren't sure. Okay, that all sounds a little bit theoretical. What does it look like in practice? Uh, here's uh, Pinus sylvestris, the, the Scots pine. So for each species, we've got uh, a map of its native range. We have got details about the species, talk about the current threat. Um, an important area here is how Scotland's populations contribute to the species internationally. Um, We uh, were able to publish this report in 2020. Hang on a second. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, you can see in there we've also got the representativeness of the seed bank, as we talked about before. So it gives an idea of how well covered it is um, and a nice little summary. Uh, also mentioning some of the things that we're doing about genetic conservation, in this case, establishment of a gene conservation unit at one of the national nature reserves. So we published our first report in 2020, which is available, uh, on the links available. We managed to get a 
we thought, a good mix of tax economic groups. The city of my seats, ask of my seats, uh, mosses and liverworts, vascular plants, mollusks, arthropods, variety of chordates. Inevitably, there's some bias towards vascular plants and chordates because that tends to be what people are interested in. Um, the steering group plan to repeat this process every five years. Um, the costs of it, it was very cheap, which is a, a big advantage if we're going to be spreading this elsewhere, which is, is the aim. At the time to design the scorecard took us about 120 person days, and the time to populate, edit, and collate the report was approximately 50 person days. Furthermore, we think the simplicity of our approach makes it very easy to adapt to the needs of the post-2020 CBD reporting. What next? Well, rather like the systems we study, the scorecard is not static. It's not fixed in its current form. Uh, in fact, it's already evolving. Future priorities uh, include incorporating the central biodiversity variables. I've just mentioned a couple of those. Doing a version for marine species, which is very important, particularly for Scotland. Harmonizing the way we report in different sectors and bringing in genomic data, but also and um, perhaps crucially to expand the scorecards used beyond Scotland. We're currently working with uh, colleagues at the University of Benghazi in Libya to see how things work in a country that has, let's face it, been through a very traumatic time of late with civil war. Uh, and if we can get things to work there, we think we can get them to work in, in any country. So thank you for that whistle stop tour. And I'll leave you with some very quick pictures, both from Scotland and from Libya, of species and habitats that we have included. Thank you very much, David. Um, so I will now hand over to our last presenter, Per, and then we should still have time for some question and answers at the end. Okay, thank you very much. I will try to share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, a handful of cases from Sweden uh, and uh, also uh, give some kind of status report on a test that is performed by the Species Information Center in Sweden. So I this thing is about uh, then applying the two Hoban et al. indicators, the one for genetic effective size, N sub E, and also the proportion of populations maintained uh, for one species. And in Sweden, uh, there is a tradition both in science and also uh, in indigenous knowledge. And actually, if you look into the observations that are, are being uh, seen where, where species are being recorded, it's, all, it's uh, very often also an interplay between these knowledges that there are experts and there are scientists and there, there, there are indigenous people and, and this uh, contact and cooperation uh, also leads to that uh, species are discovered or, or being monitored in a better way. And so you could say that one kind of focus for this is citizen science. And, and in Sweden, we are, are fortunate then to have uh, international, we have a national database that can also be uh, used internationally uh, to have a look at where species occur. And, uh, through this, it's also uh, sometimes possible to get information on how large are the populations and how distinct are they geographically. Most of these data are actually ecological census data estimation methods. Uh, most of it builds on, on geographic distinctness. Uh, of course, genetic methods sometimes uh, are used. Uh, it can be, for instance, that uh, Linda, I know, for instance, has done 
repeated genetic screening of, of fish. And from there, you can get estimate of effective population size from these data. Uh, but of course, genetic methods are also very valuable in the evaluation and valid validation of connectivity and uh, in the evaluation of population distinctness, of course. But I will focus on Sweden here, uh, which is at this peninsula together with Norway. And then uh, uh, a bit more to the east, we have Finland. And together, they are called Fenoscandia. And the thing about these countries up in the northern Europe is that Sweden and Finland, they are member states of the European Union. So they have a common framework, for instance, with respect to nature conservation and monitoring uh, what then what is called the Natura 2000. All these three countries have ratified the Berne Convention and the CBD. And so they, they we have a lot of, of common framework. And with respect to the IUCN red list work and the work with EU species status assessments, it also helps to provide more of a kind of common uh, recognized framework for, for how to collect data and make a set. Um, and in Sweden, uh, there exists a national species information center. And here is a GBIF uh, link. Uh, you can see it afterwards, of course, it's quite complicated. So from there, most of the data are. So far, genetic monitoring is unusual, but it's likely to be used much more. Uh, Sweden is investing uh, in genetic technology for, for biodiversity monitoring. So just to give you a very small handful of examples uh, to compare uh, different cases, I'll start with a near threatened species, which is the butterfly Lopinga akina. And it has two uh, distinct populations, as you can see. It has a metapopulation on the Isle of Gotland in the Baltic Sea, and it has a metapopulation system also on the mainland. So these are virtually two uh, geographically and, and genetically uh, distinct uh, metapopulations. And if we look at this conservative ratio uh, rule that effective size is 10% of the census size, uh, the kind of criterion for, for uh, effective size larger than 500 here would be 5,000. And if we have a look at the uh, estimated sizes of the metapopulations, uh, it's about 7,000 butterflies uh, of this species on the Isle of Gotland and uh, more than uh, 6,100 on the mainland, in the mainland system. Uh, of these two, uh, both remain, and there is a recovery program that exists also. So this is an example of, of a good case in a way. So provided that it doesn't decline, of course. Another example uh, is the large blue butterfly, which is also near threatened. And given this conservative, uh, point one rule, okay, the census size of distinct populations should be at least 5,000. And in this system, uh, there are the island populations uh, geographically on Gotland and Erland that seem to have large number of individuals. And then there are an, a scattered number of, of other uh, occurrences on the mainland. So the metapopulation size estimate for 2020 was in the range 7,500 up to 12,500. But it seems like the, the island populations are, are uh, qualifying for the, the kind of larger than 5,000 in top. But then also with respect to uh, the kind of, um, the remaining populations, there are a number of them on the mainland that have gone extinct. And so there are 77% of the uh, geographically distinct populations uh, that have gone extinct, uh, that are remaining. And there is a recovery program going on. 
A third example uh, is the pool frog, uh, and it has one, you could say, a large meta population at the coast of, of mid Sweden against the Baltic Sea. And it has uh, one natural occurrence in southern Sweden, which are, is natural and not introduced. So there are a few other that seem to be introduced also further south. And uh, in this example, again, the census size would be 5,000 as a criterion. And the uh, census estimate for 2020 uh, is in the order of 100 for the small uh, isolated double population and then uh, around 4,900 frogs uh, along the coast of, of the Baltic. And so this is a species which has metapopulation dynamics to some extent. There are local extinctions or recolonization, but uh, so far uh, both these uh, geographically distinct populations uh, still exist and remain. And there's a recovery program going on. Uh, another example is this thing about transboundary populations, for instance, uh, of large carnivores. And here is the wolverine. And it's an example where Sweden is, is more or less sharing a population together with Norway and also with Finland. And this connectivity genetically has been uh, validated and, and uh, confirmed by genetic studies. So, so we know the, the gene flow estimates from country to country in this census, in this uh, system. And given the conservative 0.1 rule again, uh, census size would be in the order of, of 5,000. There are actually uh, more detailed studies that have been carried out and they found that uh, this census, this uh, ratio is more in the order of 25%. And so the critical census size for, for being uh, around 500 effective size would be slightly above 2000 individuals. So what, how, what is the number of wolverines in Fennoscandia right now then? Well, from 2019, uh, the total size uh, if you add together in Sweden, in Norway, in Finland, was not fully 1400. So it's not uh, so much Wolverine, so that uh, the criteria for effective size larger than 500 are, are fulfilled. But 100% uh, of these populations in these countries remain, and it's increasing actually, and management plans exist. And the plans are increased genetic monitoring and also increased co-management between countries to, among things, uh, allow for more gene flow between the countries. Another example uh, is using, for instance, genetic linkage disequilibrium, which can be done for breeds of sheep, for instance. Here is a Swedish, uh, uh, some Swedish breeds. And from this uh, method, it was uh, seen that the effective size of a number of, of uh, breeds were very low. So effective size was in the order of 16, 32, 38, 68, and 81. And uh, th this is very much too low in order to uh, retain genetic variability within breeds. Uh, but still, uh, there is management and 100% and, uh, of these breeds remain. And perhaps it could be something with uh, the sex ratio among the reproducing individuals that are that might be skewed and that, that this could be done uh, and, and uh, to, with intervention to, to uh, increase effective population sizes in each breed. Okay, to try to uh, get into some kind of data on, on the indicator value. Uh, what was proposed was uh, to have this uh, comparison of the numbers with effective size 
larger than 500 and those uh, smaller than 500 effective size. Uh, this can be done, for instance, in this way that, that uh, you have a look at the number of populations and the, the, the percentage of populations within each species that has a larger than 500 effective size or a larger uh, than 5,000 census size. And in this example, just using these four species, uh, it would be 35% uh, as a mean at the species level. So this is one way to go. Another way to go is to uh, uh, look at the, the number of populations and uh, you will find that there were in this sample done, small sample, uh, four populations that were above 500 and, and uh, that there were uh, uh, 10 populations in total, that would be 40% uh, instead. Uh, remaining distinct populations within species, uh, the average among these four uh, cases uh, was 94%. So what is the status right now in what's going on? Well, in Sweden, the Swedish Species Information Center uh, is performing a test. And so uh, in the red list analysis for 2020 red list, there were 21,000 uh, species uh, that were assessed. And uh, these are from 25 taxonomic categories. So at this point, the Species Information Center is looking at to how many of these species and from which organism groups can the Hoban et al. indicators one and two be applied to assess whether uh, census size is larger than 5,000 of the genetically distinct or geographically distinct populations, or that census size is smaller than 5,000. And then also the proportion of remaining genetically distinct populations. Uh, just to note, uh, Sweden has 202 regionally extinct species and 219 critically uh, threatened species, likely with effective size smaller than 500. And the preliminary, uh, the Swedish Information Center also uh, said that they would perform more detailed tests for certain organism groups, for instance, like reptiles and amphibians and uh, birds uh, and mammals, and probably also vascular plants and fungi. So we look forward to seeing a report before the end of 2021 that the uh, understanding is between us. So thank you very much. Thank you for that very interesting presentation, for all the interesting presentations. Um, I think, I mean, I've been following the chat, which we're also, people are trying to respond to. And I, I think to start us off, I'm gonna start with a question to both David and Per. And when I'm listening to the presentation, both in terms of the scorecard, or in terms of the, the, the way that you selected the species for monitoring, I have a few questions. One is, you know, how do you try to ensure cross-border collaboration on the species where you're going to need it in terms of also even for the monitoring aspect. I think the wolverine is a good example. But then to me, it also brings up a broader question, which is what David was saying is, how do we roll this out with countries in a way that's going to allow us to aggregate up and make some sort of sub, you know, sub-regional, regional, global, uh, comparisons where we're saying, you know, this is this is the situation in this region, particularly as a lot of these species, I mean, they don't they don't know where we've put country borders. So how do we sort of make sure that we are? Um, I mean, you might say comparing app, not comparing apples and oranges. In this case, we might be comparing mushrooms and frogs. So how do we how do we you know provide some guidance so that we have some sort of uh, standardization? Thanks. Pat, do you want to go first? Well, well um, my spontaneous uh, uh, 
response would, would be really to, to really encourage and, and uh, see the, the situation that, that we are in with respect to the conventional work and, and with uh, conserving biodiversity. So uh, to the extent possible collaboration, of course, between the countries. And uh, with respect to Fenoscandia, Northern Europe, uh, Scandinavia, uh, it has been working well. I mean, there are of course some differences sometimes, but, but uh, overall, I, I think that uh, uh, it, it's a high enough priority in in, in the countries, so so, so that the. There are uh, formal agreements also between heads of state so, so, or, or um, uh, ministers of environment. So uh, in that way, uh, there has been a very positive, uh, how do you say, uh, engagement in, in a way uh, and uh, stimulus to, to more uh, collaboration between the countries. Okay. Yeah, I think all I would add to that is that we've been quite lucky that we've got existing relationships outside of the UK and indeed outside of Europe, which I think is very important because anything we design has to work in countries that don't have the same resources as we do. Uh, when it comes to cross-border, uh, we didn't have any migratory species in our list. Um, so being part of a an archipelago uh, with the North Sea between us and, and, and uh, uh, most of the rest of Europe uh, has made that a little bit easier, but we appreciate that isn't going to apply elsewhere. At a summary level, which was your second question, Gillian, um, for each species, we have a, a risk and a response. So for example, um, I think it was uh, Cedix lanata, which is one of the species on that, so it's a willow. So we've classed that as moderate risk, and mitigation effective, and then confidence level high in the assessment. So we end up with a table at the end of it for these species, which allows anyone to see what we've got in there. And what we expect to do is have a, a table that grows effectively. So at the end of it, you can say, right, of the species we have assessed, uh, 20 have negligible risk, five high risk to whatever it might be. And this is the level of mitigation we've got against because the mitigation is one of the key things, because obviously over time we want to get better at it. Um, so I think I, I think that is what's going to help. We we'll try and build things together. The other thing is that because we're now going to incorporate that we have the EBVs, which we didn't when we started this process, because we're able to incorporate those in the species accounts, uh, that will also make it easier to compare between countries. But the one danger I'll quickly flag is if you only concentrate on species that are in the, the red end of the IECM categorization, you end up with a biased sample. And also frequently it's the commoner species where if you have a sudden catastrophic decline, you really have the problems. I, I mentioned European ash. It's not done too badly in the UK, certainly not in Scotland, but elsewhere in its European and Asian range, the population has collapsed. And it's species like that that one frequently needs to worry about more than, say, one of our endemic white beans, um, which if we lost it, it would be a shame. But if we lost all the ash in the UK, that would be a catastrophe for a number of species dependent on it. And the whole resilience side of it, as to go right back to the beginning of the presentation by Linda, in, in the face of climate change and the face of uh, novel pests and pathogens goes right back to genetic diversity, which is why we need that mix of the common, the rare, the important ecosystem species. Thank you for that. I see her that you want to add on real quick. Yes, I, I think that this, this collaboration, I mean, and also with respect to education, that uh, scientists can interact with uh, universities and uh, authorities in the different countries and also in that way uh, kind of cross-fertilize with, with, with increased collaboration uh, 
can really be a good thing because usually uh, the benefit from from uh, education and things like that that you share knowledge and, and scientific science-based knowledge is also a very very good thing for countries so, so it's uh, uh, usually a positive ingredient thank you i think this brings me to the next uh question that i was going to ask to alicia and, and jessica and it also um definitely relates to what david just said on on bias so there is a question in the in the chat on working with the citizen science community and, and how to engage. And I think that this is really important because if we if we only use the citizen science data that's available, it will be skewed towards birds likely, you know, there will be bias introduced by using the data that's available. And I know that both of you mentioned trying to use available citizen science data. So my question is really the flip of that. It's not how do we use the citizen science data that's available, but how do you form relationships with the citizen science community and researchers at the national level to try to guide it so that you're able to get uh, more information collected on the species that, that you know that you want to measure moving forward? Thanks. Um, if I can go, uh, we do, we've set up various uh, collaborative projects with various stakeholders, including citizen scientists. So it's mainly involving them from the beginning and um, helping guide. So for example, with the Western Leopard Toad, we have a lot of community groups within the Cape Town area that go out to help toads crossing the road and gathering data on sex and how, how many road mortalities and all this stuff. So they've been trying to find a way that this data could be useful to science, but the way they were collecting it wasn't effective. And so what we've done is included them in a lot of stakeholder workshops that we um, take that we conduct, especially with respect to um, the adaptive management of the species. So there's the city involved, national government involved, um, the research institute that I work with who helps guides the policy of it. And so we include them and help guide their um, data taking and then formalize it and standardize it amongst the different groups. That's just one example that we do. But a key thing is to also verify those records um, for projects like those big national projects where for bird data or reptile data, for example, um, where entries just get put into a central database. iNaturalist, for example, there's a lot of these global competitions or countrywide competitions. A uh, key thing is to get the right people to verify those records. Um, and make sure photographs accompany them. So if they're not part of smaller community, if it's a big national endeavor, get um, proper identifications involved because oftentimes that's the most limiting issue that I find. Thanks. Um, uh, can I sure. complement that? Yes. Yeah, so um, in Mexico, natural protected areas belong to people it's not like national parks in other parts so that means that there is people living there and recently there has been more and more projects trying to involve people into conservation activities this includes citizen science um, so this is an opportunity because it allows you to have some training to the citizen scientists it's i mean of course if someone used downloads the app and goes out there, it also works. But the idea is that more small groups of um, local monitors are being trained. And as part of the activities that they already did already, like, I don't know, like, like just monitoring that no one enters and this kind of stuff, they are now doing um, biodiversity monitoring with these apps. So that also allows to include, uh, in some cases, some sampling methodologies, especially in EVERT. So this could allow, uh, for instance, to add a transect or things like this, which allow us to get abundance data. So I think these are sources of opportunity. Um, as for identification, I, I agree this is a challenge. And something we have been doing at Conavio is that we actually are paying people for uh, just going to the identity to the data available and trying to identify records. And I think this is something that can be done with a little investment. It's not, a, of course, this is not anyone's full-time job. It's just like a 
something they might already be doing and they are, I don't know, master students or experts in a particular taxon and very enthusiasts. But uh, with this extra help, they feel empowered and they start doing it more. And this has been very useful and I think could be done with a very small uh, investment. Um, and also something else that Jessica also mentioned is the, the challenges, which we think they are very useful to incorporate um, to incorporate more or less remote areas, which is the most challenging, at least for Mexico. If you see Mexico City is full of records, if you go to rural areas, not so many. So adding um, these kind of challenges can be useful. And this is where I think having or telling people that we're going to use this data for seeing how genetic diversity is could be an extra. Because if in your municipality, a species hasn't been recorded and defined it, then you are adding more than if you are just adding a species that has been seen anywhere else. I don't know if I'm explaining myself, but what I'm trying to say is that we could promote the importance of having populations of a species in your local area as something useful for the country. And I think this could be encouraging for, for especially small municipalities that are uh, willing to assess their biodiversity. And I think, yeah, I think I cover everything. Thank you. Thank you. I think we are actually out of time. So um, I, at this point, would like to thank everyone for participating and, and thank the panelists for the excellent presentations and interventions. Um, I would like to remind everyone of a few things. One, this is recorded, so feel free to share it with people and listen to it if you're interested. Uh, two, I think that everyone on the panel is happy to be contacted. I'm speaking for everyone, but I, I think it's okay. So, um, so feel free to reach out if you have specific questions to any of the people who are involved. Uh, and also, we are planning to send out, or Adriana is, is planning to send out a, um, a note after this for all the registered participants that includes some additional references and information and all the presentations will also be online. So with that, again, thank you all. And, and I hope this was useful to everyone. I know that I learned a lot and I hope that you did as well. Thank you, bye-bye.